this time, uh, this session, we had uh, one uh, special lecture and uh, uh, four uh, presentation from uh, Korea, as well as Yangon University of Economics. So firstly, I do like to uh, Dr. Park Tae Ho, so who is an uh, advisor of Korea Myanmar Research Association and is also dean of the San Jose State University of the United States. So he will present uh, AI, a game changer for SCM. So I would like to invite him uh, and uh, please give him a big hand. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you for inviting me uh, for this uh, presentation. I'm uh, really uh, glad to see all of you on Zoom. Uh, should be uh, in person, however, in this kind of a uh, pandemic situation. Uh, anyway, uh, we have uh, this uh, good uh, conference together, sharing uh, our research ideas, and then uh, checking uh, the, how we can uh, cooperate together. So the theme of uh, this uh, conference also mutual cooperation under uh, uncertainty. Uh, we are definitely uh, we have a lot of uncertainty. You also me everybody experienced uh, this kind of a, a lot uh, uncertainty during this uh, pandemic, right? So the. Um, uh, we have uh, a lot shortage uh, in uh, medicine, in uh, materials, products. So the um, now, how we can uh, handle all those? And then uh, the, uh, we have a uh, great technology now, and the uh, we developed you know the uh, a lot of uh, new technology, also advanced uh, existing technology. Then uh, I saw the. Uh, I heard uh, a lot the uh, presentation uh, regarding uh, policy and uh, you know cooperation, uh, but the um, uh, you can also think about the uh, technology and also supply chain. Okay, probably uh, you heard about a lot of issues in the supply chain nowadays. So the um, uh, you know you uh, many of you uh, wear a mask. So we had a, a lot shortage of a mask, right? The, uh, and then uh, we had a, a shortage of a food, and then also now the uh, uh, chips, right? Then so the um, maybe uh, you can uh, uh, put the uh, your research uh, area in uh, policy, uh, and then uh, why don't you just uh, think about the. Uh, uh, technology issues, okay? So the uh, developing countries definitely uh, need uh, to develop uh, new technology and then uh, use the technology to produce, uh, uh, you know, the uh, excellent uh, products. So that's why I brought this, uh, uh, the uh, topic of uh, uh, AI, you know, the uh, what the AI, right? The uh, AI, is that the, uh, uh, game changer for supply chain management. So can I uh, share this uh, screen uh, with you? Okay, so let me uh, uh, share this uh, screen. Can you see uh, this one? Yes. Okay, so the um, I brought up this uh, uh, title. The uh, Since uh, <laughs> we don't have enough time, I will um, uh, give you a brief idea of uh, my uh, recent uh, research uh, uh, topic. The um, uh, three of uh, my colleagues at the uh, university are uh, working together for this. Uh, uh, so the I'm uh, Theo Park, the uh, professor of uh, the uh, School of uh, the uh, Global Innovation and Leadership at San Jose State. Also, I'm uh, in charge of uh, uh, Silicon Valley Center for Operations and Technology Management. So the, um, now, before I uh, go into uh, artificial intelligence, AI, the, um, let me uh, just briefly uh, tell you about the uh, uh, fourth industrial revolution, the um, Korea and uh, many uh, you know, Asian countries. The, uh, even uh, here, uh, we talked about 
uh, the fourth industrial revolution. And then now the, uh, we developed a lot of uh, uh, those technologies the, uh, you could see. So the, um, we are living in uh, cyber uh, physical systems, right? The, uh, we use uh, digital uh, you know, technology and then using a digital technology, the, uh, we change it, our life. The, um, so the policy also should be changed in that sense. So the, um, <clears throat> the uh, fourth industrial uh, revolution has uh, nine uh, technologies here listed, big data, autonomous robots, and then uh, augmented reality, etc. Okay. Now, <clears throat> then why uh, the uh, uh, AI is not here? <clears throat> AI I use uh, uh, most of the tools. Okay. So the um, uh, AI uh, can be uh, defined uh, in many ways. The, uh, it started with uh, this definition, technology using uh, which we can uh, create intelligent system that can uh, simulate the human intelligence. And then later on, somebody else uh, defined it slightly different. However, the uh, all are saying that the uh, we can uh, develop, we can uh, manufacture, we can uh, make a system using human-like intelligence. Okay, so the, then what the uh, human-like uh, intelligence? How we can uh, build in build it into the system, into the uh, uh, product? That's a question, right? So here you can see a brief, uh, you know, the one uh, the uh, uh, AI uh, system, the, uh, it's called uh, feed forward neural network. So the, uh, in this system, we have a lot of uh, information data which will be uh, input to uh, uh, a certain uh, the uh, uh, AI based uh, system that uh, feed uh, forward uh, neural network. And then uh, that the uh, feed forward neural network uh, use uh, the input and then uh, calculate uh, using a certain uh, the algorithm. There are many uh, different algorithms and then uh, generate the uh, output. Uh, then uh, the uh, people use that the uh, uh, information uh, to uh, uh, produce products to uh, um, inform the uh, information to somebody else and then to use uh, those to uh, predict something. So that's uh, the uh, basic fundamental structure of uh, AI. And then, then uh, the uh, AI is new. Actually, it's not new. It's been a uh, half century. The, uh, when I uh, uh, went to uh, uh, here, America, came to America uh, for my uh, PhD study. That's uh, the uh, uh, late 19, uh, no, middle of uh, the uh, 1980s. And then uh, the, uh, this uh, uh, neural network uh, technology came up the early 1990s. So I uh, used uh, this one for my uh, research at that time. So it's been uh, the, um, what, the uh, more than uh, 30 years, I uh, know this. The, um, so the, uh, However, the, uh, there is uh, some uh, reason why uh, the, uh, it didn't fly at that time and then uh, it ca came uh, at this time. So the, uh, I will uh, go into that later. So the, um, uh, anyway, the, um, it, this uh, AI uh, <clears throat> can be uh, going into uh, all kinds of uh, things uh, to our life. Okay, so the, um, uh, also there are uh, virtually uh, unlimited number of uh, applications. All industry can use this uh, AI. So the, um, uh, that's why uh, big companies now investing a lot of money on it. And then the, uh, you can see a lot of uh, industry. I would say uh, the uh, all industry here I listed the uh, seven one, uh, healthcare, education, manufacturing, retailing, supply chain management. However, there are tons of, tons of, tons of uh, industry using uh, AI 
or maybe a potential uh, to use AI. Wait a minute. Oh, I, I, okay. So some questions the uh, we can uh, think of. Okay. The uh, is AI a new technology? I already uh, told you it's not. The uh, it's been uh, quite a bit. But the uh, why uh, uh, this time uh, you know the research industries are focusing on the why uh, this time the uh, uh, let me uh, briefly uh, tell you why why uh, the um, uh, it didn't work a uh, long time ago when I uh, uh, see this uh, neural network 1990s the reason uh, is the um, based on my uh, you know the uh, knowledge experience. At the time, technology, computing technology, uh, was not this uh, uh, much, uh, you know, fast. The um, uh, you can uh, think about 1990s uh, computing uh, technology. The uh, very slow. The uh, <laughs> this time uh, we are talking about gigabyte, right? The many many uh, gigabyte. But the, at the time, just the uh, uh, even a uh, one megabyte is very big at the time. <laughs> And so the uh, computing, uh, you know, speed was not this much. And then also storage. The, uh, I think the, uh, you are using uh, the uh, big storage now. The, uh, um, what's that? The, uh, the uh, uh, 500 uh, gigabyte and then uh, 1,000 gigabyte, something like that. At the time, <laughs> very small. So the, uh, also the data. Data uh, was not uh, a lot. The, uh, so data shortage and then uh, speed uh, slow and then uh, storage uh, limited. The, all this kind of uh, you know things, uh, uh, the uh, block, uh, the advance of uh, uh, neural network technology, AI technology. Okay, and then why are the, does it recently get attention from industry and researchers? I already told you that. Also beyond the those, the, uh, now the uh, industry uh, is using AI a lot and then uh, there is a potential. The, uh, so the um, uh, universities uh, you know, invest, uh, also industry invest. That's why uh, it advanced uh, very quickly. The, uh, is AI a really promising technology? I will uh, answer this one uh, in a later slide. And then uh, what about industry application status? This one also. What about in the uh, supply chain operation field? So I will answer all those uh, in later slides, okay? So first of all, the uh, AI is an emerging technology, yes. The, um, if you look at the uh, uh, statistics, the um, uh, global spending on AI uh, will be nearly $98 billion in uh, 2023. That's uh, what? Only two years apart from now, okay? And, the, uh, and then AI, the um, investment is growing exponentially. The, uh, 70% of a business will use AI by 2030. Okay, 70% of business. And then uh, the uh, three quarters of uh, executives also uh, believe that AI will substantially uh, transform their companies within three years. That's uh, the uh, uh, collected 2018, so three years ago, the, uh, that means uh, this time uh, AI uh, substantially transformed their companies. Is it right? The, um, uh, the, this uh, researcher, the, uh, they, uh, you know, they uh, asked the uh, executives about it. Then the uh, executives took uh, three quarters. Uh, so 75% of the uh, executives at the time said the uh, uh, this around this time, three years later, that's uh, this time, the AI will substantially transform their companies. Maybe uh, you can uh, uh, see uh, 
uh, the answer in the next, uh, in the uh, later slide, okay, whether it's uh, true or not this time. Then uh, has uh, AI been uh, successfully implemented? Uh, the answer is uh, no, maybe, you know, quite no. The 85% uh, of AI initiatives ultimately uh, fail to deliver their uh, the, uh, initial uh, promises, okay? And then uh, that's why uh, the uh, many companies are now uh, wait and see what's happening, okay? So they uh, don't, they hesitate to step on it at this time, okay? The, uh, and then the 45% um, of senior managers found it difficult to integrate AI with existing people and promises. Think about it. The uh, AI using um, human-like, you know, intelligence, right? It's not human being, but the uh, human, uh, some data, uh, many, many data collected, uh, and then trying to use those to predict, uh, you know, whatever. So the, uh, then uh, do you think uh, humans uh, the, uh, believe it quite? The, uh, maybe I will uh, give you an example later on. The, uh, so the, uh, how can you also embed the uh, integrate uh, that human-like intelligence into the process, okay? So the, uh, that's why 47%, uh, you know, almost 50% uh, of uh, senior managers found uh, some difficulties. And then uh, the, uh, another issue is uh, the um, uh, upskilling uh, uh, employees uh, to work with uh, AI, okay? So the, um, I told you, the, uh, uh, in order to use uh, AI application, the, uh, you have to uh, integrate the, uh, all those uh, human-like intelligence into the system. Also, not just the uh, system products. The, uh, you have to uh, integrate that into your work life, okay? So the, um, uh, that's why um, it's uh, the uh, big issue in the uh, corporate company's culture as well. Okay, also the uh, employees may uh, suspect that the, uh, uh, they may uh, lose the job. Okay, also if the uh, uh, AI integrated into their uh, culture workforce, what's gonna happen to their uh, life at work? Okay, also the uh, here knowledge as well, okay. So the, um, in order to uh, integrate uh, the system, uh, the AI application into the uh, uh, system, the, um, you should have uh, the, uh, a lot of uh, intelligence also, okay? So uh, this is an example, <laughs> the, uh, you can see the, uh, uh, whether uh, the current uh, AI uh, can uh, help business, okay? So there are many, uh, you know, issues still, okay? The, uh, it's a little bit uh, premature at this time. The, uh, it depends on the, uh, uh, the uh, process also. The, uh, an airline uh, recently launched uh, the uh, chatbot helping uh, the uh, customers. The, uh, this is the screen, okay? And then I typed in this, the uh, how will uh, the airlines, you know, the, um, uh, the uh, membership program, uh, you know, member benefits uh, be changed. They uh, are changing the membership uh, structure benefit uh, now. The, uh, actually, uh, they uh, uh, try to uh, change it uh, two years ago, uh, and then uh, starting uh, uh, not, uh, last year, this year, but they postponed it, the, okay. So the, uh, I uh, uh, know the, a lot of uh, stories, 
from uh, other you know the uh, sources and then uh, i went to the uh, airline and then uh, see uh, really they said the uh, uh, i mean uh, other uh, sources said the uh, postponed and then i want to see uh, the uh, you know how much uh, you know how long postponed and then uh, uh, how it, it changed and then i typed in this guess what what i get i got this <laughs> nothing <laughs> the, uh, you see this uh, screen, right? I typed in this, nothing came up. Same screen. So the, uh, what I did was uh, I changed the uh, word a little bit. I uh, removed the, uh, I just used the membership and then uh, that they uh, give me uh, this, okay? So the, uh, you can uh, change your name. Or, that's not what I want to see. I want to see uh, their membership change, structure change, benefits. And then uh, the, I uh, use the different uh, term, benefit only. Then uh, same thing, see? The, uh, I changed how will membership be changed? How will benefit change it? Same answers. See, the, uh, if I, uh, uh, as a customer, face this uh, one, what do you think the, uh, I, uh, you know, will do uh, with this one? So the I uh, tried, tried, and then I gave up. I uh, was uh, frustrated, and then uh, I jumped into uh, the uh, uh, website and then uh, Googled it, okay? So the, uh, that's why uh, currently the uh, uh, people are saying uh, AI, uh, embedding AI to the product system, but the, uh, uh, many of them are not quite working as uh, planned, okay, intended. And then uh, here, supply chain uh, entities, the, uh, it shows you uh, supplier network, supplier side, and then uh, manufacturer uh, inside, logistics, purchasing, manufacturing, and then a warehouse, and then a user side. Okay, then how we can uh, integrate AI uh, into the uh, those functions? How can we use uh, AI for those functions? Here, the uh, you can see uh, AI technologies, the uh, machine learning expert system, robotics, and then uh, natural language processing, machine vision, and then speech recognition. The uh, see the all. Uh, AI technologies, the, uh, are those uh, new? No, the, um, uh, even uh, the uh, 1990s, the, uh, we had all this, okay? The, uh, except the, uh, uh, this uh, terminology, machine learning. Machine learning uh, came up the, uh, recently, but the, uh, the others, expert system, actually, uh, when I was uh, the, uh, in a graduate uh, program, the 1980s, the expert system came up and then I used this one for project, okay? So anyway, the, uh, in the supply chain, we have to, uh, we can uh, the, uh, apply those technologies for uh, demand forecasting and then a risk management and then a professional contract and then scheduling all those, okay? So, the uh, uh, industry uh, are using uh, this one. The specific, you know, example is uh, uh, this uh, uh, Kilber that uh, the uh, sourcing software company. They uh, use AI uh, embedded sourcing, but to uh, uh, automate the uh, buying process. And then Amazon also uses AI through how this uh, supply chain for decision making, okay? So in this, again, uh, many, uh, you know, industry companies, companies, they uh, use this one, uh, but the, the uh, uh, how much uh, successfully uh, they uh, uh, implemented, that's uh, some kind of a question, okay? And then uh, can the AI uh, be a game changer for operations and supply chain management? The um, um, see here, AI has received uh, relatively little attention 
the um, so uh, still a uh, premature. Many organizations are still in an early stage of adoption of or fail to implement AI. Okay, and then a uh, failure to scale up from pilot implementation. So all these are uh, saying that the um, uh, AI is uh, a little bit the uh, uh, premature technology at this time uh, to use it for operations and supply chain management. Okay, so there are some other you know, uh, industries, they uh, use AI uh, heavily and then uh, successfully, but the, um, in general, I would say um, the, uh, it's still uh, you know, the early stage. Then, uh, but the, uh, uh, don't worry, the, uh, we have also the, uh, a lot bright side for that. AI can uh, fundamentally res reshape existing operational practice and uh, task. Applications of AI will play an influential role in uh, rebuilding and reconfiguring global operations and supply chain management. And then uh, the, uh, some uh, you know, success factor uh, for that, uh, you should have uh, data and then also knowledge of uh, AI uh, field and then uh, supply chain capability to adopt AI, okay? So we have uh, a little bit the, um, you know, the uh, premature uh, stage. However, we have uh, also bright stage, okay? So that's uh, about the, uh, uh, today's my uh, presentation about AI in uh, supply chain management uh, in general. Okay. The, uh, if you have a, a question, you can uh, you know, ask me. We, I don't know how much time I have, but the, uh, I try to finish it uh, quickly. Yeah. Thank you very much. And then uh, I'd like to have uh, some question from the floor. Uh, so if we have a question, then uh, turn on your the uh, the unmute your 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 unmute and then uh, ask a question. Let me uh, stop the uh, uh, sharing. Yes. Any question? Okay. okay I have a, yeah. Okay. I have a one question. Actually, sure. you told you told us that uh, the AI is a premature, but is brighter in the future. So, but uh, in as a social science uh, researcher, uh, AI is a kind of uh, some uh, the sector that uh, relate to the uh, only to the engineer. Uh, but uh, I think the AI should be uh, applied to the the social science uh, uh, researchers. So, so what? What uh, the sector? Well, what technology uh, can we uh, can we as a uh, science uh, social scientist to, to utilize uh, the AI or some uh, the the AI technology? You know the uh, AI, as I told you, can be used uh, in uh, all industries. Okay, also all fields. The uh, not just the um, uh, manufacturing. Uh, industry, but also, you know, the uh, social, uh, you know, science uh, area. The, uh, like, you know, the um, social uh, science, the, um, uh, there are many uh, questions the, uh, about it. The, uh, let's see, um, uh, I don't know the, uh, what a good uh, example, but the, um, uh, yeah, let's see uh, the uh, medical science, the, uh, uh, they use uh, uh, AI a lot nowadays, okay? So the, uh, there's a medical uh, symptom and then uh, AI uh, give them uh, a certain advice using a uh, previous uh, uh, data experience. Likewise, uh, social science also, okay? So the, um, uh, let's say, uh, psychology <laughs> for example okay some people have uh, the uh, you know uh, psychological uh, you know issue problems then uh, the uh, uh, they uh, the uh, ai 
the uh, uh, can uh, give them uh, advice using uh, some uh, you know the uh, uh, data uh, or maybe uh, some of uh, the uh, uh, information uh, from a certain uh, sources. Okay. Yeah, a lot of uh, the uh, uh, areas. Okay, we have a uh, one question. Uh, the Professor Han. Yeah, why don't you come come, come forward? Uh, have uh, one more question. I got a question actually. Uh, um, so you you talked about the AI and then the uh, I you briefly explained the history about the AI and then. Uh, what, what you said is that in, in 1980s or in 1990s, the expert system was um, emerging and then you, you, you were involved in the project. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I think that there is a kind of peak growth in 1990s. And after that, there is a some kind of um, deep in, in, in developing that kind of technology. So uh, there is a kind of, you know, up and downs in, in, in developing and, and and in the in the uh, in the stages of stages of diffusion of that technology. Mm -hmm. So, um, what do you think in the future we would have another uh, you know, up and down kind of um, circulations or the changes or patterns in, in, in diffusion of, of that kind of technology? For instance, AI. The um, uh, I uh, don't think. Uh, we will have up and down uh, situation in the near future. The, uh, because uh, the, um, as I told you, the, uh, we have uh, the, uh, some kind of uh, the uh, resources uh, supporting uh, AI now, the uh, computing, very high speed computing. And then uh, now we have a uh, 5G, right? And then the, uh, uh, we have also a lot of uh, algorithms developed now. Also, the uh, big data. I didn't go into big data. The uh, uh, we have a big data technology now. We are gathering a lot of uh, information now. So the um, uh, it will accelerate AI technology and then application of uh, AI technology. Okay. The um, and then um, later on. The, uh, I don't know how many uh, years later, the, at this time, uh, actually uh, accelerating, okay. The, um, some years later, the, um, if uh, the uh, techno, I mean, uh, the storage uh, also, the, I don't know how much uh, it will be advanced, okay. So the, uh, there may be a certain uh, threshold maybe, okay. The uh, speed also, the, um, uh, you know, the, uh, there is a uh, limitation in uh, human uh, capability, right? Now the uh, 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 Intel and then AMD, they uh, develop very fast uh, uh, CPU. However, the, I don't know how much uh, they can uh, go, okay? So that's uh, depending upon that kind of uh, the uh, supporting technologies uh, limitation, okay? So the, other than that, I think the um, uh, it will accelerate accelerate the, uh, the current trend. At least I think the uh, ten years. The um, think about the uh, autonomous vehicle. The uh, what do you think? The um, uh, five years later, we are going to have a really uh, autonomous uh, vehicle. <laughs> no, I don't think the uh, even uh, five years. The uh, um, there are many, uh, you know, the uh, issues we have to resolve. So the uh, ten years later, maybe okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very yeah. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to uh, ask you to give him a big hand of further a good presentation. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Then uh, let me move on to the presentation. Uh, the first presentation of our session is that uh, Professor Nuti Mulotu. 
the professor and head of the head of department of department of economics uh, she will present uh, the impact of uh, long term and the short term external debt on economic growth in myanmar so i'd like to invite her hello uh, do you hear me yes sir. Uh, okay, so let me uh, start uh, my presentation. Yes. So now I'm sharing my screen. So uh, I hope that you, you all are, can see my screen, right? Okay, yeah, you so, can go ahead. Okay, so uh, first and foremost, I would like to uh, express my greatest gratitude to all uh, responsible persons uh, from Korea Myanmar Research Associations for giving me the opportunity to participate in the paper reading in the sixth international, 16 international conference on development and regional cooperations. And I also would like to share my special thanks to everyone who are participating in this paper reading. So today, uh, my presentation is about the impact of long-term and short-term external debt on economic growth in Myanmar. So this topic is one of my interest to see and test how the external debt and economic growth are related uh, for Myanmar. So our, here I divide my presentation into the following our, our sessions. So firstly, our, I will talk about the macroeconomic theory on the government debt and the literature review in brief. And then I will explain about my rationale of the study and my objectives of the study. And after that, uh, I will talk about uh, the data and methodology that I used in my estimation. And then I will describe about uh, my estimation, estimation procedure. And after that, uh, I will uh, present about uh, my result. And uh, finally, I will conclude with the findings and recommendations. So our first, in the first, uh, let me uh, 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 talk about macroeconomic theory on the government debt. So with respect to the macro, macroeconomic theory on the government debt, the traditional views are of uh, the traditional view are mentioned that the government debt you know, through tax create an increase in the total demand and higher income through the effect of stimulation, so consumer spending and you know, lowering the national saving in the short term. So this short run effect in term causes reducing both capital stock and the national income of the economy in the long run. So this is uh, the traditional view on the government debt. And, uh, and uh, by contrast, uh, the Ricardian views, are, which is based on the sense of the forward-looking consumer in examining fiscal policy. The Ricardian view mentioned that the test cost does not create a stimulating effect on consumer spending. In fact, it is merely the rearrangement of the tax from the present generation to the future generation. So here, the two of you have a different you know, opinion you know, with respect to the government debt on economic growth. Uh, on the other hand, uh, uh, there is a debt overhand theory. Uh, this, uh, uh, this theory, the, the, uh, the, the theories uh, which is indicated by the Krugman 1988 and the Sachs 1989. So according to them, uh, they mentioned that uh, if a country persists or optimistic about developing a large volumes of debt, or the debt is a far exceed its ability to repay for the country, so there will be a discourage from further investment. Because an indebted country requires paying interest on the debt as a debt service, and you know, which will lead to reduce the investor involvement in the economic activities of indebted country and thereby uh, discouraging economic growth. And the sex in his that uh, lever uh, and the uh, debt lever curve, uh, it, it is illustrated that a state or affairs or excessive indebtedness steadily generate efficiency losses of an economy. 
And you now there are uh, um, other uh, aspects of macroeconomic theories, uh, which is also related to the government debt and economic growth. And you know, the, uh, the other aspect of macroeconomic theories also poses the debt. The government debt you know, can probably produce other outcomes when the amount of the debt is enormous because a nation with uh, excess, excess level of the debt can also additionally inspire politicians to shoulder overly burden to the future generations. And in addition, a nation with excess level of debt may experience not only a situation so increasing the risk or capital flight, but also reducing the power of influence on other nations. So our, this is our up to now. Uh, I present about a uh, uh, I present about the macroeconomic theory uh, uh, that mentioned to the government debt and economic growth in brief. So now let me move on to the literature reviews. So uh, uh, in, uh, uh, there are many literature reviews uh, that are. Uh, uh, investigated about uh, the relationship between the government debt and economic growth. But uh, most uh, literature review uh, found that mostly they found that uh, the government debt and economic growth are, uh, has a, uh, a negative relationship. It means that uh, mostly they found that uh, the, the government debt or the external debt are uh, discourage economic growth rather than encourage economic growth. So for example, the empirical evidence of the Robert Barrow stated that the public debt will turn into taxation and which will lead to higher taxation position and then reduce our potential production. And now there are also are many lit, uh, other literatures are in my, uh, I presented in the, my study, but I pick up some literatures are uh, uh, and the, the, in the, uh, their study, uh, they mostly they found that uh, a lower rate or long-term economic growth is associated with a higher levels of public debt. And other also uh, pointed out that uh, developing country uh, with a health debt burden, heavy debt burden, tend to cause a negative effect on economic growth. And you know, on one hand, the other researcher also are mentioned that lower total external debt levels leads to higher growth rate. And but higher external debt lead to negative impact on economic growth. So this is a brief or I a brief uh, briefly presented about the literature review on the government debt. So let me move on to the rationale of the study. So a case study is Myanmar. The study period is uh, from 1983 to 2007. So uh, before I talk about the rationale of my study, uh, let me a uh, quick look onto the current macroeconomic indicators or macroeconomic situations of Myanmar or uh, in terms of GDP growth rate, saving and investment, uh, current, account, current account and the trade balance and the fiscal operations and deficit and the external debt. So in this slide, uh, <clears throat> what we can see here is that uh, the, uh, the, the trend, we can see the trend of the GDP growth rate. So oh, 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 uh, generally the trend of the GDP growth rate over the year uh, perform as a gradually decreasing trend. Uh, but uh, in the, uh, according to the World Bank estimations, uh, <clears throat> here we can see the GDP in uh, 2007 is 5.8%, uh, and GDP growth rate, sorry, GDP growth rate in the 2018 is 6.4%, uh, and in 2019 is 6.8%. And uh, the GDP growth rate uh, has a uh, drop down to 1.7% in 2020, and you know, it will further uh, drop, you know, uh, sharply drop uh, to up to minus 18% in 2021 at the present. This is due to the, uh, the COVID-19 crisis that are hit, uh, hit to the Myanmar economy. 
And other hand, on the other hand, uh, there is a political uh, instability also. Uh, uh, the Myanmar also experiences the political instability. So uh, the World Bank estimated that the GDP growth rate in the future maybe will be uh, dropped down further. So this is our GDP growth rate about Myanmar. And also we can hear is the sector sectoral contribution to the GDP also are, will have a, a downtrend. And uh, uh, with respect to inflation, you know, we, what we can see here is that the inflation also uh, rate also will be gradually, on average, will, will gradually, in, uh, gradually increases and which uh, is up to 6% in, uh, at the present uh, year. So in this slide, uh, it shows the conditions of our saving and investment and the situation of the export and imports of Myanmar. So here, what we can see here uh, is that uh, the saving and investment gap as percentage of GDP has become larger since uh, 2014. Uh, uh, with a minus 7.8% and it was remained at a 5.7% in 2017. Uh, so here, uh, it, it is mentioned that now according to these figures, we can understand that there is the existence of domestic resource deficiency in the economy. So it, it also means that the net saving or the gap of the net, sa the net saving could not meet the required investment and capital to support the growth of Myanmar. But uh, this are uh, does uh, this uh, gap, the saving, the net uh, saving investment gap, are still uh, has a, uh, a negative no, value? So this is uh, 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 the expo import, the conditions are expo imports. So here, the negative trade balance was successively uh, from three point minus three point six percent in 2014-15 and up to minus eight point five percent in 2017 and 18. And the negative trade balance are, uh, still are, uh, has a negative, uh, negative value, and it is uh, uh, the, this are, uh, it's still experiencing the uh, negative or uh, value at the present. So, uh, let me move on to the current account balance and the fiscal operations. So here, in terms of the current account, you now it showed that the current account with the negative balance payment as percentage of GDP has increased from minus 3.5% in 2014-15 to minus 6.8% in 2017 and 18. And uh, uh, regarding the current fiscal balance, uh, it, it is reflected that it's a lower of the target level since the actual budget deficit in 2017 and 18, and it was 2.6 percent. But the projections of approved budget within the overall spending mix is expected to increase the budget deficit due to the focus in giving on the capital spending, so which would drive up the deficit to increase up to minus 8.5 percent in 2000. One, 2021. So this highlights that the suggestions of spending on capital projects tend to cause the unceasing the challenges and confrontations uh, in the budget administrations. So thus our issuing the treasury bills and bonds become a source of increasingly financing to the deficit budget in this scenario. So our as I have mentioned earlier, owing to facing the fever, the fiscal and capital measure and the you know, saving and investment gap and the net expo gap. So over the year, it is uh, one uh, it, uh, uh, possible that the external debt, both the short run and long run has been taking place as a financial sources of Myanmar to fulfill its economic growth. So in this uh, slide, uh, we can see uh, the figure. It shows the long-term and the short-term external debt in terms of current uh, US dollar million from 1983 to 2017. So uh, here, the amount of long-term external debt has been increasing over the years, but it has uh, been rising you know, substantially after 2010. 
enter or this uh, in this slide, or we can see uh, the debts, uh, the repayment on the long term debt and the interest on the long term or debt in terms of US dollar millions of million from uh, 1983 to 2017. So here, the debt. Uh, uh, we, we can see here is the debt services or the repayment on the debt has the same trend with the change in the amount of external debt. So it is implied that the debt service increases as long as the external debt increases. So, the, uh, so uh, it can be understand that there is a positive relationship between the external debt and the debt services. So uh, in this figure, here I, uh, I mentioned the total long-term debt and the short-term debt as a percentage of the total debt and you know, the debt service as a percentage of our export of goods and services from 1989 to 2017. So our, what we, we see here is that the total long-term external debt that had been taking place as a huge percentage as compared to the uh, total short-term uh, debt. And the debt services as a percentage of export of goods and services are also decreased substantially from 1987 to 1999, but it has increased in trend again after 2010. So in addition to debt, are the uh, aids and grants from multiple creditors also become the supplementary and external financial sources of Myanmar to be able to support its augmented growth encouragement. So the source of the external debt has been taken from the multiple sources. And while the aids and grants are mainly uh, received from the UN agency and the bilateral aids uh, flow from the DAC donors. Uh, so uh, this, uh, in this figure, uh, it showed the bilateral aid flow from DAC donors, mostly from uh, the uh, countries from Japan, Germany, Australia, and Canada, US, uh, UK, and US from 1983 to 2007. However, there are many other bilateral donors, such as Australia, New Zealand, Korea, Spain, Spain, France, and Belgium, etc. They also contribute to aids and assistance to Myanmar over the years. So this is uh, the net official development assistance and official aid received now by Myanmar. So, uh, so the main could thing you, for- Could, Ogin, you, could uh, you shorten the, the presentation because of the, the limit of time? Uh, so okay. shorten the, your presentation. Oh, okay, okay. Oh. So the main aim from owing debt to Myanmar is to enhance not only its economic growth, but for the improvement of the macroeconomic adjustment, like a higher investment in infrastructure, project, agriculture, education, health, and even to acid poverty reductions. So by this mean, the interest of my study is to see whether the over-dependence on AIDS, borings, and the debt uh, provide the right way to sustain economic growth of Myanmar. So to fulfill this mean, I constructed two objectives for my study as follow. So the first is to investigate the impact on long-term and the short-term external debt on economic growth of Myanmar and to examine how the debt survey impact on the economic growth of Myanmar economy. Yeah? So let me move on to my data and methodology, but let me uh, present you know, this part in brief because of the time limitation. So here, the data is I use a time series data and I collect the data from ADB sources. And the model I use in my estimations are the time series analysis as the nature of the data is time series. So here I use time series analysis, co-integration text, and the main model I, uh, I use in my analysis is the VETA error correction model. And, and after that, it's a follow by diagnostic test to confirm whether the model outcome and efficiency certain and reliable for my study. So this is my model specifications. So the main variables are there are five main variables. They are growth domestic products, long-term external debt, short-term external debt, interest on the debt, and the repayment on the debt. So all variables are transformed to the log form. So the estimation process is our, uh, so let me skip this estimation process. No? And this is the main uh, uh, model. And this is the detailed uh, interpretations about the models, uh, the models. So let me do this. 
So this is uh, the estimated results of our better error correction model, so which illustrated the impact of external debt on economic growth. So uh, let me move on to my results. Uh, so firstly here, what I found here is that the coefficients of error correction terms has a negative sign and the p-value is significant at 5% level and the speed of adjustment is at 8%. So therefore, the initial that caused this equilibrium situation can be corrected by 8%. So to be specific, uh, it, is, it means that the disequilibrium between the economic growth and the long-term and short-term external debt can be corrected and it can be restored back the economic growth to its initial position by 8% adjustment in each time. Therefore, the result is expected to resolve in terms of economic and economic tricks model. So secondly, <coughs> here, uh, what I found here is that the main variable long-term external uh, debt show a negative relationship to economic growth. Since the coefficients of the long-term external debt produce a negative signs and the p-value is a highly significant at 1%. But on the other hand, the, 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 the coefficients of the short-term debt show a positive sign, but the p-value is significant at a 10% level. So this result points out that the short-term the short debt, short term debt supports economic growth, growth. So that it can be concluded that short-term uh, debt encourage economic growth, but the long-term debt discourage economic growth. So <clears throat> in the third, uh, the uh, repayment on the debt and interest on the long-term debt, debt that are the debt services variable. So here it is found that the coefficients of the repayment on the long-term debt has a negative sign and it expects a result, but the p-value is not significant in this case. So here it can be concluded that repayment on the long-term uh, the long-term debt and the economic growth has a negative relationship in this case. And on one hand, the coefficients of the interest on the long-term debt create a positive sign and the significant levels of p-value is at a 5%. So by this mean, the interest on the long-term debt and economic growth has a positive relationship. So uh, this result uh, does not in line with the theoretical assumption, but it is possible that whether the amount of interest or uh, rather small or negligible payback to the uh, creditors. So there is a structural break in the model. So the chart tech break test showed that there is a structural break in 1996, but the structural break does not have any fundamental effect on economic growth. So finally, all the variable, all the uh, statistic are uh, uh, the, the, the uh, have uh, sufficient uh, sufficient. Uh, 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 su sufficient conditions, for example, R square adjust, uh, adjusted R square indicated that the explanatory variables such as long term and short term external debt and the debt services can be explained on the economic growth by 78%. And the F statistic also significant at 1%, and the value of Darwin Watson statistic is also at 2.5%. So, which means that the estimation is free from autocorrelation problem. So, overall, in the uh, it can be concluded that the model are, is are, is are fitted for the estimation. So this is our beside to confirm whether the model is efficient, normal, and reliable. The following diagnosis tests they have done. So all test results show that the model used for the estimation is efficient, normal, and reliable. So let me move on to my conclusion part. So uh, my study analyzed the effect of the external debt on economic growth of Myanmar based on the two objectives by using the data from 1983 to 2017. So in the first, it is found that the short run external debt can boost economic growth, but the long term external debt discourage economic growth of Myanmar. So this finding support the views of traditional assumption on the government external debt, which indicate that the debt overhands leads to a lower capital stock and lower income in the long run. And the repayment on the long-term debt has a negative relation to the economic growth. So here there is a problem when a country is less ability to pay on its external debt or no ability to create the repayment over the years. So this absence of the repayment causes accumulations of the debt of indebted country. 
and the accumulations of the debt leads to reduction in investment and capital because investors are unwilling to invest or investors are less involved in investment activity in such indebted country. So this event is a kind of the cut of private investment and which in turn costs a lower income, it's low, uh, it's low our economic growth. So recruitment and say, as I have mentioned above in the literature review, which they explain that if a country persists or is optimistic about the developing a large volumes of debt or the debt is a far exceed its ability to repay. So there will be discouraged from further investment. But on the other hand, the other uh, several study you now which uh, tested whether the indefinite influence on the economic activities of developing countries. So they argue that if a, uh, foreign loans are converted into capital and other necessary imports, the development will occur. But from this study, the findings support uh, the tr traditional view of the effect of the debt, which discourage economic growth on the case, the case of Myanmar. So uh, thus, uh, based on this finding, uh, I would like to recommend uh, that uh, the overlines on the loans and debt is not a perfect solution to expanding our expenditure and failing the result gap to boost economic growth. And saving and net export are the most important source of the capital stock and foreign income of an economy. So since Myanmar has a resource gap, it should raise a saving to fill up the gap between the saving and investment so as to obtain and finance the required capital stock. In addition to the, this, it should expand the volumes or export potential so as to cover not only the uh, volumes or import, but also for the trade surplus earning to finance it investment. So in terms of fiscal sector in Myanmar, the fiscal aggregate show that declining and the stagnant revenue at the same time rising expenditure create a large fiscal deficit. So this is reflected by the income tax revenue as a shares of GDP does not tend to increase the econo as, uh, to increase as the economy grows. So uh, it, in this case, it is need to improve the fiscal measure in order to finance the deficit budget and it should be taking play as a central issue in the fiscal sectors of Myanmar. So this is the end of my presentation. So thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. So in order to utilize our time efficiently, so after we hear the full presentation, then uh, let us uh, some take us some time to discuss uh, all the four uh, presentation. So I'd like to invite uh, some second uh, presenter, uh, Professor Dr. Han jong Kyu, who is a professor of Inha University. He will present uh, exploring the and antidote anti of the global supply chain uh, flexibility in an age of uh, uncertainty. So I'd like to invite him, please give him a big hand. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, thank you for introducing my, myself. Uh, I, I am Dr. Chong Chu Han. I am currently working for Hina University, Asia Pacific School of Logistics. So uh, today's topic uh, in this presentation is, is the uh, configuration uh, flexibility in an age of uncertainty. Um, I would like to make it uh, very, very simple with some bullet points uh, in my research. So in doing uh, this, this presentation, the first one, but firstly, I would like to uh, introduce my motivation and we'll uh, explain the configuration flexibility concept and with the research model, the, the empirical test um, process has, will be uh, presented, uh, followed by the, the final discussion. So uh, there is a series of uh, risks and uncertainties uh, in this age of 2021, like um, we, we, we still having Korea-Japan trade dispute and US-China trade war. And of course, the COVID-19 pandemic is uh, highlighting the rule of um, configuration flexibility uh, uh, and also the configuration of supply chain. Configuration here means the, uh, um, it means the arrangement. We, we need to rearrange the relationship of firms uh, in, in, uh, when there is a interruptions uh, like COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, for instance, uh, some uh, manufacturers in China, they close their um, manufacturing facilities and then we need to seek 
some alternatives in, in, in sourcing some uh, raw materials and same finished goods to finalize our uh, production process. So the importance of recomp reconfiguration has been emerged. So, um, uh, but there is no research to identify the, the, the preconditions and, and antecedents uh, of com configuration flexibility. So in this research, I would like to find out what, what they are. So globally, um, when there is a uh, supply chain interruption like COVID-19 pandemic, uh, many, many people think that, and also I, I also totally agree that that is the, because of the interdependence of the global supply chain and also the uh, economy of scale orientation, mainly focused in China. Mm -hmm. And the philosophy of just in time uh, that would like to reduce any uh, unnecessary uh, inventories uh, there are they, they are main regions of the uh, why uh, supply chain or global supply chain has been affected by the the uncertainties like COVID nineteen pandemic. So um, as you can see from this slide, uh, majority of industrialists they think that you know uh, the the uh, lean or low cost um, based approach to uh, acquiring their goods in different continents is a good idea. And also, same thing happens in Korea. So according to uh, KFI, um, in the age of uh, interruptions, the supplier base should be diversified and then the rural uh, configuration has been emerged. It's a very critical issue. Um, so there are different types of configuration, but um, as you can see from network to global supply chain. So I am focusing on the uh, supply chain configuration in international setting. Um, and also the uh, impact of reconfiguration flexibility has been identified in, made, in, in, in many literature. For instance, it is affecting, if you can see the right hand side, it is affecting value creation and it has got a, a direct impact on firm performance and, and um, it also affects dynamic capability. It also affects firm performance. So this is a kind of dynamics we can see uh, regarding the impact of reconfiguration flexibility. Actually, uh, the, the term flexibility should be distinguished from agility or responsiveness that are, are used interchangeably in, in describing firm capabilities in, in uncertainties. Flexibility, as you can see from the focus, it is a capability to use uh, multiple options in efficient manner. So uh, to adapt the, to different types of uh, environmental uncertainty, you need to have multiple options to use to adapt to changes. And also, uh, it has got a hierarchical uh, um, scheme. So in plant level, farm level, in supply chain level, in, in domestic, and global supply chain level, uh, different types of flexibility should be identified. And then the, the red one, reconfiguration flexibility is a type, uh, is the aim of this research. Uh, but it is very difficult to find out uh, the, um, to, to draw up very integrative and systematic framework to, uh, to describe these uh, different kind of um, classifications of antecedents. So I, I, I classify them into three levels, micro, meso, and macro. The macro is about uh, internal resources. So I would like to find out the preconditions of uh, reconfiguration flexibility from uh, within a firm. And the meso is about inter-firm relationships. And macro is about external resources. For instance, um, you can join to the trade, trade association uh, marketing uh, activities or, or uh, trade promotion uh, programs from the central government, that kind of thing. So here, this is the research model. Uh, so uh, micro level, meso and macro, the determinants, they have uh, the sub dimensions. For instance, for the macro level, it has got an international entrepreneurship and other two. And in meso, we got three subsets. And macro level, we have uh, network capability with local entities. And the second one is in network capability with the home entities. So um, I have made up this hierarchical order in describing see, the configuration flexibility. And um, each of um, dimensions, it has got uh, sub indicators. 664 six, indicators and meso level, it has got the uh, 664 six, indicators. I will not explain every open uh, because of the time. 
but you can you can see that that um, different level has got different indicators uh, from this research model. And configuration flexibility, I made up this uh, concept with um, eight indicators, including in-house and outsource <coughs> alterations, onshore, offshore alterations, uh, market exit and re-entry decisions. <coughs> For the model test, I have acquired uh, 184 samples from South Korean funds and then tested the model uh, using uh, PLS SEM. <clears throat> and in PLS SEM, it is uh, recommended to use measurement model assessment for the each variables, and then the, the threshold of this uh, measurement model assessment is one met. So uh, it is fine, the model. And in, in terms of path analysis, every um, path in their research model uh, was identified as very, very significant. So as you can see from this uh, model, the antecedents in three different levels, macro, micro, meso, they are all um, the, the uh, preconditions for the global supply chain configuration flexibility uh, in an age of uncertainty. So um, my, my framework that, uh, that is having these three dimensions has been um, confirmed with this empirical test. And uh, this implies that this configuration flexibility should be considered as a, in, in a very systematic and integrated manner. And also I, I find out that to increase the um, configuration flexibility in international setting, not only firm, but also national institutions uh, such as um, trade promotion programs should be uh, supported. Um, but there is a limitation, uh, a mediator they could uh, mirror some very explicit, clear impact of uncertainty can be uh, increased the validity of this uh, research model. This is the reference for this um, research. Thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. And now um, move on to the, the third presentation. So, Dr. Nunu Luin, uh, the professor and head of the uh, Department of Management Studies of uh, YUE. She will present uh, uh, the impact, the effect of foreign direct investment on uh, China's economy. Uh, the Honorable Charles and members of the conference committee, distinguished guests, and my respective colleagues. Good afternoon to you all. First of all, I'd like to express my sincere thanks to the chairs and members of our conference committee and the organizer of the committee for giving me a valuable opportunity to present my research work at this great conference of 16 ICTEC. Today, I'd like to present my research works on the effect of voluntary investments on China's economy. Firstly, uh, let me explain the rationale of this study briefly. As all of we know, foreign direct investment uh, has been recognized as a catalyst for economic growth and modernization in developing countries, emerging economies, and um, countries in transitions. Through uh, its power to creating employment opportunities, assisting in human capital formation, triggering technology spills over, stimulating domestic invest, investment, contribution to international trade uh, integrations, and creating more competitive business environments. Among developing countries, we have seen that China has been uh, the re remarkable success in attracting FDI and achieve significant economic growth through our effective utilization of FDI. Moreover, another point, that make my interest is its economy system. Chinese economies has been categorized as a market-oriented mixed economies, as well as we call socialist market economy, which is dominated by SOEs, take all enterprise and mixed ownership enterprise. Let me briefly present about the economy re reform process of China's. Um, In 1978, China started to adopt the open door policies and 
its economic sectors has been gradual, uh, gradually liberalized by improving the political and legal environment and maintaining an open and fair market environment to encourage the foreign investments. <clears throat> In 2001, China became uh, the member of World Trade Organization, WTO. Its accession to WTO led to the substantial improvement in trade and investment regime through uh, some liberalization measures, including privatization of SOE, protection for private property rights, elimination of various barriers, removal of geography and other restrictions, increased foreign ownership limits, and then discriminating treatment to the foreign banks. Um, as a result, uh, China, uh, as a result, China, sorry, the accession to WTO led to increase, a uh, significant increase of export oriented to FDI to different regions of the country. As a result, China has been the second largest FDI destination in the world since 1993. And it's also achieved the double digit GDP growth rate since 2003. In 2010, it has been the second largest, since 2010, it has been the second largest economies in the world. In this slide, I present about the comparisons of per capita GDP during its uh, reform period, started from 1978 to uh, this uh, previous year, 2010. During these 50 years period, it's achieved 77 times increase in market debt, market debt GDP. It is a very remarkable. So these factors stimulate my interest to study the effects of FDI inflow to economic growth of China. That's why I specify the two objectives for this studies. First one is to investigate the contribution of FDI in China economy. And the second one is to examine the effects of FDI on economic growth together with other de uh, determining factors for the period of 2000 to 2019. Um, here, I'd like to briefly present about the theoretical, theoretical backgrounds of this studies. As all of we know, um, FDN can be categorized as a, uh, classified as a domestic market oriented FDI and export oriented FDI. Domestic market oriented FDI uh, are mainly triggered by the multinational funds to asset the markets of host country for resource efficiency and economies of scale. Um, at the, on the other hand, for uh, export oriented FDI is motivated by the difference in federal price and supply securities. So MNEs diversify their value chain activities and capabilities to different regions with the forward and backward integration. We can see that both uh, domestic uh, market-oriented FDI and export-oriented uh, FDI are coming into the China's economy with the large uh, growing market size and improving infrastructures and human capitals. As all of we know, FDI contribute to growth of the host economy through some measures, uh, including enhancing capital formation, employment creation, promo export promotion, transferring management and technical know-how, bringing access to international production networks. And also FDI bring the spillover effects on the economy um, in which uh, skills, technology, and productivity or domestic firms can improve through the participating in backward and forward linkage or MNEs. They are a technical assistant to local partners. Even uh, can, it can be realized from the competitive pressure uh, is that by the foreign counterparts. <clears throat> and also there is an, some negative effect on host economy as presented in these slides, um, including an even distribution or return, higher transfer price, high profit repatriation, surpassing do domestic fence in competition and influence on government policy and so on. So we can say that the role of FDI in economic growth can be country specific. It depends on the economic policy, trade strategy, FDI orientation, human capital, absorptive capacity, and initial size of the host, uh, initial size of economy of the host countries. So, um, several scholars um, make the studies on the role of FDI in economic growth. And I present uh, the same uh, empirical 
result of the scholars, uh, one of the scholars found that FDI is the only determinants of economic growth, determinants of economic growth only for the higher income developing countries. It is not true for the lower income developing countries. And another finding is that uh, the lower FDI in economic growth can be significant for those economy with sufficient absorptive capability. And it can be reasoned that less developed countries are normally left behind in technological levels, limited human capitals, and less absorptive cap capacity to realize the spillover efficiency of the MNEs. It's, uh, it's linked to the not significant impact on the economic growth of low income developing countries. In this slides, I'm briefly uh, I'm present about the overview of China's economy. In, in this table, I'm present about the annual growth rate of GDP, average annual growth rate of export, average annual growth rate of FDI, and average annual inflows of FDI in billions of US dollars for the four, four periods, 2000 to 2004, 2005 to 2009. I divided 20 years, 20 years period into the four periods. In this table, we can see that uh, Average annual FDI inflow is gradually increased during 20 year periods. But the interesting point is that average annual growth rate of GDP and those rate of FDI have the similar patterns. Both growth rate increased till end of 2010 and after 2010, both growth rate gradually declines uh, till now and also uh, average GDP, uh, average annual growth rate of export increased uh, until around 2006 7 and then it's uh, an annual growth rate gradually steadily declined till now in this studies to in investigate the contribution of FDI in china economy i measured three indicators these are sectoral distributions of fdi inflows uh export share of foreign investors Fans into their export and employment share of foreign investor fans into their employment. <laughs> so, in this slide, in this table, we can see that the secondary set, we can see the set of redistribution of FDI inflows. Secondary sector is the state important in attra attracting FDI to the China. Annual FDI inflow to tertiary sector supports those of the secondary sector since 2011. And also, the export of foreign investor firms took a large share in China's economy till 2011. However, after that, the share of domestic firms has exceeded those of foreign investor firms into their exports. At the same time, FDI helped to uh, increase the employment opportunity in China. Its shares in total employment reached the highest points in around uh, in 2013 2014 with uh, three point eight, around 3.8 percent, then gradually declined uh, to around three percent in 2019. So uh, now let me move on move on to my empirical analysis. In this part, to examine the effects of FDI and e economic growth together with the other determining factors, I applied panel data analysis for a sample of 31 provinces of China over the period of 2000 to 2019. Um, in this uh, analysis, I used the conceptual model of way 1993, in which um, provincial GDP uh, was regressed with the FDI inflow, export, initial size of economy, human capital, technology transfers, and population growth at the provincial level. And here I present about the, my conceptual uh, model of my analysis. <clears throat> in this slide, uh, I present about the definition of variables used in this analysis. Um, in which I'm present about measurement unit and expected impact on GDP of each um, independent variables. Here, three factors. Initial size of economy, human capital and technology transfers are in fact uh, rather difficult to measure. So based on the previous studies, I use some proximity to measure these factors. 
to measure the initial size of economies. I use the gross, uh, in this analysis use the gross capital formation of each province in initial years. And also human capital is approximate with the number of students enrolled in secondary high schools of each province. Since uh, innovation is the one of the result of technology transfers, I apply the number of domestic patent, patents granted of each province as a proximity to technology transfers. All of the data, I use the secondary data for this analysis. All of the data are collected from the various issues of China statistical yearbooks published by National Bureau of Statistics of China. In the slides, I present about the uh, result of the analysis. As shown in this table, the determinants of China economy uh, can be seen as a FDI inflows, a, uh, initial size of economy, human capital, and technology transfer, because these four variables have positive, a significant positive impact on um, provincial GDP. Uh, at 1% significant level. Exports also have the positive effect on GDP, but it uh, only have the uh, only significant at 5% level. So <clears throat> based on these findings, uh, we can say that increasing FDI inflows uh, have the impact on further growth of the China economy and also high initial growth uh, capital formation can lead the economic growth in the long term. Investment in human capital is the impact and contribution to growth of the economy and technology transfers also have impact on economic growth through sp spillover effect of foreign investments. As expected, uh, population growth have, uh, has shown negative impacts on provincial GDP, but it is not significant. Um, according to the standardized coefficient value beta, technology transfer is the largest contributor to the provincial, provincial GDP, followed by human capital, foreign direct investment, initial size of economies and exports. It implies that the most important determinants for the growth of an economy can be absorptive capacity from foreign investments and developing uh, human capitals. Based on the findings of this analysis, I like to conclude uh, my studies, the findings of my studies. According to the uh, results, secondary sector is the largest FDI recipients of China in the early periods. Sector choice of foreign investors firm have been shipped to the territory sectors in recent years. Another one is share of foreign investor firms in today uh, they took last share in China is for till 2011. After that, the share of domestic firms is the shares of uh, those of foreign investor firms. So <clears throat> uh, we can say that FDI helped China to integrate the further into the regional and global market to contribute to have the federal balance of payments bring a big source of foreign currency and all these better lead to the significant growth of the um, China's, China's economy. Moreover, <clears throat> however, we found that uh, the impact of FDI on employment creation is considerably low by comparison with other contribution, its contribution to export and other economic sectors. <clears throat> so, Based on the findings, uh, based on the result of this analysis, we can conclude that GDP is affected by foreign direct inf uh, FDI inflows, export, initial size of economy, human capital, and technology transfers. Moreover, uh, direct, uh, we can say that direct effects and spillover impacts of FDI lead to the increase in capabilities of domestic firms to improve the productivity and competitiveness in initial international markets. So uh, based on the findings of this analysis, we can conclude that FDI is led, uh, has been largely contributed to the industry development and international market access, employment creation and income generation of China economy, thereby growth of uh, the economic growth of the China's. Um, these are all of and on my presentation. Thank you for your attention.
Yeah, thank you very much. So uh, after after we have a full uh, presentation, uh, let us talk about the, uh, some uh, the issues. And then I'd like finally, I would like to invite uh, uh, Professor Huang Min Chol, uh, who is a professor of the Sunchon National University. He will present uh, uh, the evaluation of the performance of Korean program on international agriculture uh, focused on uh, Nicaragua. My name is Hector Wong. I work at Sunshine National University in South Korea as a professor. Uh, it is a great honor to be here and to have an opportunity to present my research topic in this session. My research topic is the uh, evaluation of performance of a Korean program on International agriculture focused on Nicaragua. Here is the overview of my research topic. First, I will introduce my research goal. Second, we will explain what Korea is. Third, we will explain, explain uh, Nicaragua's agricultural conditions. First, we will discuss why Copia projects are needed in Nicaragua. And then we will talk about the evaluation method. And then we will discuss research results. Finally, after finding research results, we will suggest policy strategies. Now, we will discuss my research topics law. In international development cooperation, the agricultural and development, global development is a field that has recently received attention to eradicate poverty and hunger in developing countries. In particular, during the development of agriculture to commerce and establishment of a rural government system in developing countries are recognized as effective and sustainable growth methods. Rural development administration based on Korea's agricultural and rural development experience since 2009 has Contributing to solving the agricultural problems facing the international community through the joint development and technology transfer of customized agricultural technologies through Korea program of international agriculture in developing countries. It is necessary to suggest a way in which Korean projects are effectively and efficiently conducted through the performance analysis of the Korean Center's projects. We will explain briefly Korean. Korean Center is a journey in 2009, the year when Korea joined the EEEAC. Korea, a bilateral ODA program in the field of agriculture, technology, and factors as a 20th anniversary in 2021. Our VA launched this program to support the developing world with Korea's advanced agricultural technology. Korea develops and disseminates agricultural technologies and strengthens the capacities of farms and structure. We want to develop and disseminate parallel agricultural technologies to local circumstances and needs. Copia Center works closely with its counterpart organization in the capital country. The first center of Korea was opened in Vietnam in August 2009. 
As of 2020, the criminal sentence of working worldwide in 22 countries, eight in Asia, seven in Africa, five in Latin America, and two in CIS. Then the project is in developing countries with three steps. First step is developing a logic. First step, Copia develops several technologies to look at this. Second step, Copia performs a trial and develops a belief rather success model to further delete the project. No Copier conducts spin of the success model in cooperation with other Korean organizations engaged in ODA, such as the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Now, we describe Agricultural development in Ikawaka. Here is the map of Ikawaka. Ikawaka is the second first country in Latin America and the first from capital in Central America. To about 58% of the federal population of Ikawaka is below the former demand. And the living area of the same people are rural and missing areas, and about 85% of the small and medium sized farmers are small, uh, small farmers. However, for the more, about 21% of the population in the situation where various crops are needed due to a balance in the perfect time. The government's crop productivity is low as there are not enough cultivated varieties and is sensitively affected by climate. And and due to lack of cultivation requirements. As a result, the production of planted area is a bit low. In these regions, they are needed for their centers. Especially, they are needed to increase productivity by introducing excellent varieties to get them involved to produce a higher level of varieties in a situation of severe poverty and climate changing and crisis with a regardless of abundant resource and good policy support as a national priority project in the need for agricultural cultivation technology development and field application is increasing. RPA, we call our site and agricultural technology cooperation in March 2017. And Columbia Center was established in July 2017. This table is projected Columbia Top of the Ikawaka. The projects are divided in three types of First, the final tomato are included in two projects. Rice are included in two projects also. Lastly, crops are divided in sesame and soybean. Six 
relevance, efficiency, effectiveness, impact, and sustainability. Each element, uh, each element is included in each criteria for standards. Thank you very much. So we have uh, uh, five minutes uh, for the, this session. So I'd like to ask you uh, some questions uh, from the floor. So if you have any question about uh, uh, for a presentation, uh, you can choose any uh, presentation. So please, if you have uh, any question, then raise your hand or unmute and uh, talk about. Uh, yes, I have a question. Yes. Uh, my question goes to the, the first president, uh, Dr. Uh, Norti. Let's go ahead. Yes. question? Yes, go ahead. Oh, uh, yes. 
uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you to Dr. Naughty for her presentation. So <clears throat> uh, actually, I didn't catch up uh, the, whole uh, the, the whole presentation because uh, internet connection is up and down here. Uh, but I see her estimation time span period uh, covered from 1983 to 2017. So my question is, uh, uh, is there any particular reason for why using this uh, time span? Uh, because during this uh, period, Myanmar went through a lot of uh, structural and political changes. So if, uh, in, in, in such, uh, for example, in 1996, uh, we have a uh, visit Myanmar year during that period where we received a lot of foreign uh, direct in, uh, investment. Uh, also in 2010, uh, we have a lot of ODA received from uh, from overseas uh, overseas period. So during uh, so in such uh, uh, structural and policy political uh, changing period, uh, if we estimate the, the the whole period in one one equation, we believe that. Uh, uh, structural parameter will be changing those periods. In this case, we, we, uh, this lead to misleading uh, results. So my question is whether uh, Dr. Norti uh, test the structural change test or not. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank yes. you, uh, Professor, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Dr. Santu Aung for your very well questions to me. Uh, actually, as you has mentioned, uh, from 1983 to 2017, we have a lot of structural change in our economy in terms of political, in terms of uh, uh, other, uh, other, other factors. <clears throat> so here, uh, I use the time series data from 1983 to 2000, 2017. Uh, because uh, the first is our uh, uh, is uh, data availability, <clears throat> and then now there is a structure change, and I, I also found that the structure break uh, there has uh, there uh, uh, there is a structure break in my uh, estimation, but uh, <clears throat> I think maybe it is uh, due to the data, <clears throat> so. Uh, what I found here is the structure break is in 1996. And then I checked the, this break, but uh, this break uh, in this period, uh, during this period, uh, I uh, don't see uh, any particular, uh, particular uh, effect on the growth for this change based on this change because uh, the structure change you know, shows that there's no significant on the growth. So uh, I finally, uh, I uh, give my, result, I give my uh, uh, conclusion that uh, there is no uh, fundamental or uh, economic or uh, uh, fundamental change which affect on the economic growth. So here I would like to, uh, also uh, uh, tell you that maybe or uh, I may have uh, the uh, data estimation <sighs> problems and also data problems. So maybe my estimation uh, it, it maybe is not perfect. So <clears throat> here I try as much as possible to, uh, uh, to, uh, to try to, uh, to stay in line with my theory. So I just can pick up, actually, I also use other variable, but here, uh, 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 there are a lot of reasons now that uh, cannot, uh, how to say, the result cannot reflect uh, the, uh, the, the theory assumptions. Uh, so finally, I reduce the variable, only, uh, only uh, five variables, and then now I use only this variable because uh, only the four or five variables can reflect uh, the how to say uh, the, the reasonable result for me. So that's why, mm, uh, that's why uh, in my estimation, uh, maybe it's not uh, perfect, but just I can uh, do something that are uh, uh, something that are uh, that are nearly reflects to the um, theoretical assumptions. 
So I think I need a further, maybe further, uh, for, uh, further or broad, broadly uh, investigation to, uh, to, uh, to this, uh, it, uh, for this case. So I, I admit, I admit that yes, there's a lot of changes in this uh, period, in those period. Uh, but um, according to the data, the data uh, which have shown only that uh, one structure breaks. So uh, my, I pick up uh, this results and I uh, uh, conclude the result according to my finding. Okay, uh, so uh, the, thank you, Dr. Noti, yeah. <laughs> Is that satisfied for you, Dr. Uh, Santu Ao? <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Noti. Yeah, my suggestion is uh, if you find uh, uh, some uh, some evidence or structural break, yeah. uh, if we uh, if we uh, uh, estimate uh, two or three uh, break. Uh, yeah, break, equation right? and instead of yeah, one yeah. equation, mm. uh, yeah. I believe that we might find some uh, interesting or some. Uh, consistent uh, uh, estimation result. That's my suggestion. Yeah, thank you for your reply. Yes, yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Yes, yeah. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Actually, it is very difficult to uh, to forecast uh, the one variable by the uh, one variable because uh, economic growth uh, can be is uh, affected by the several uh, factors, not only the the government debt, uh, the but also other the variables such as uh, technological change and uh, the input uh, size and uh, some other the FDI. So there are many, uh, the variable, many kinds of variables. So, so it is not uh, the, the efficient, it can be, it may be uh, the inefficient to, to forecast uh, economic growth by the one variable. Uh, but mm -hmm. uh, in some cases, uh, we focus, foc we uh, focusing on the one variable, the, the effect uh, on the economic growth. So, so uh, actually, the, if we want to have a more the more discussion uh, about the presentation, but we are behind the schedule, so uh, we cannot have uh, the the conclude the, the the closing our session. So, <laughs> so the, in the in the near future, now we uh, will have uh, some more uh, time to discuss uh, about the the Myanmar economic uh, development and the other the, the some uh, the research on that issues. But uh, this time we have to, to finish our the session. Uh, okay, then uh, thank you very much all the participants participant, uh, to joining our the session. Uh, though we finish our uh, this session uh, three and then after we, uh, ha after we have a, a 20 minutes uh, break, then we will continue to the session of four. So uh, take us some break and uh, some uh, see you uh, in the next session. Thank you very much.